Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Celie Martin. I'm I'm best known as Maria's father right now, uh, and I'm going to talk about the uh, the 1789 Christmas Eve collision of the HMS Guardian with an iceberg. And there's a lot there's a lot in this story. Um, let's see. This should work. The uh, this was an unusual event. The, the uh, Guardian was part of the second fleet to resupply the British colony in Australia. And it was carrying about a thousand tons of material from England to Australia. And it stopped at the uh, Cape of Good Hope, got more stuff, and then sailed uh, about two th about 2,500 kilometers when it collided with an iceberg. And I was reading a biography of Joseph Banks, and and I my first response, who was heavily involved with the cruise, my first response was. There's no icebergs here. So I, I was very surprised by this. And I, I believe I talked to uh, Doug and to uh, Ted Scambos, and uh, they were equally surprised. So I decided I would look into it further, into this collision, see what happened. So, so this, is, this is heavily related to Cook's three cruises, three voyages. So I'm just going to review those first. And the naturalist on his first cruise was Joseph Banks. And here's a delightful picture of Banks. Uh, I believe it's painted when he was about 30. And that was about the age he was when he was on a cruise. And uh, the, cruise, the cruise surveyed uh, Australia, part of Australia, and Banks was just fascinated by Australia, and uh, the the ship, the Endeavour, also collided on a reef here, and had to be careened on shore to have the bottom fixed. And I believe that that Doug McHale wrote a paper comparing the destruction of icebergs to the uh, to the to the banging of the hull against the reef, the Great Barrier Reef. So so there's so there's actually some some relation here between. I mean, there's a lot of science that went on on this cruise. So so anyway, Banks Banks was fascinated by Australia, but before anything happened, we had the the second cruise. And this was this was Cook's greatest cruise. I, I just take my hat off to him. He did a wonderful job. And here's a picture of Cook by John Hodges, who was the artist on the cruise of Cook at age 45. And I think this is the best picture of Cook that I know. This is just a marvelous picture. And so Cook had the two ships, the Resolution and Adventure, and he tried, he basically circumnavigated Antarctica, but he never was able to, uh, to get in and see land. He also surveyed this area here, which people thought there might be a, a hidden continent. He also carried the, uh, the Kendall watch, the Kendall K1, which was a copy of the Harrison H4, probably the best timepiece of the 17th century, sorry, 18th century. And uh, he loved it. I mean, he was a glaciologist, you know, we all love new tech. And this was about the newest tech there was. And he used this to determine his uh, longitude. And he loved it. And this was the only watch of its kind. It was like the Harrison watch 
which was the only one of its kind. But so this is the only watch in the world which could which could determine lat longitude with a high degree of precision. And uh, he was he was quite happy quite happy to have it. I highly recommend reading the account of his second voyage because he's a Crook is a very witty writer and it's public domain. You won't have to buy it or anything. So uh, enjoy. And then we come to his third cruise. And on his third cruise as a midshipman, he had Edward Rue, who was going to be the captain of the guard, Guardian. He sailed with Cook. He enlisted in the Navy, or he was put in the Navy when he was 12 years old. He sailed with Cook when he was 13 or 14. So he was quite young. So this shows Edward Rue as a child, and this shows him as an adult. And this shows the, the, uh, the lines that the, uh, the track that the two ships covered where the change in color is due to the death or assassination, or whatever you want to call it, of Cook in Hawaii. So, so Rue came back to the uh, to the England, and then uh, some years later, he became captain of the HMS Guardian. But this is not the Guardian, but it's a very similar ship. And it's what called it's what's called a fifth rank Royal Navy ship. And it carried, in this case, 23 men on its trip around uh, the tip of Africa, and one girl who was 10 years old. And the the girl was named. Elizabeth Schaefer, she was, her father was on the cruise. His name was uh, Philip Schaefer, and he was from Germany. He was from Hesse, Hesse? and he, uh, he had served in the, uh, in the American War for Independence on the British side. He was a mercenary, and when he came back to Britain, he volunteered to go to Australia as a colonist. At the same time, the uh, Joseph Banks, who played a great role in the colonization of Australia, built built a uh, what he called a plant house on the uh, on the quarter deck of the Guardian. It measured about three meters long and about two meters wide and about two meters high. And he, so the, so the Guardian carried about a hundred plants that he was sending to Australia. On the lower deck down here, they had a series of stalls which were carrying animals, horses and cattle. And, and the, the large livestock were on this lower deck down here and up here they had things like pigs and chicken and sheep and all that so this this the guardian all the guns were taken off except two and it was basically a giant transport ship and in the hold it carried uh, about a thousand tons of stuff ranging from clothes to sewing needles to whatever implements you would need to start a colony it also carried 25 convicts who, uh, it's a little hard to talk about this, but they were being sent there to basically serve as indentured servants or slaves for the, uh, for the colonists uh, in order to, uh, to build, build a colony. It was also served as a, as a it was a punishment to get the, to get the, convicts out of England. They were being transported. So it's it's hard to talk about this, I want to say. So 
Oh, and these are a few people who were on the ship. Uh, and here's uh, Elizabeth. And here's a midshipman who plays a role in this story, whose whose name is uh, Richard Stiles Tremblett. He was he was a senior midshipman. He had previously been promoted to eleven, to to lieutenant, but he was busted back to midshipman for some kind of a strange riotous party that he'd gotten involved in. So he's not a, a very reliable person. So where did the icebergs come from and how did the shipwreck occur? So let's look where they came from. Now this is a figure, I'm sure some of you have seen this or similar figures. This is uh, courtesy of David Long and the red lines show the trajectories of the 20 year, show the daily iceberg positions over a 20 year period. And what we see is the results of the icebergs. Some of the icebergs form in the Ross Sea and they're carried around the continent. And then more icebergs form in the Weddell Sea a lot. And then they're carried out of the Weddell into what's called Iceberg Alley to join the uh, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And then some of these are carried further to the east. Now, in these little green dots here show the positions of the icebergs that, uh, that the Guardian observed. And just for the heck of it, I've added the positions of some of the icebergs that uh, Cook observed. And um, David Logg's technique, the icebergs have to be a greater, have a, a length greater than 10 or 15 kilometers or they're not visible. So I've tried to choose the big icebergs that, uh, that Cook saw. And these two are a little out of phase. Um, and I was very pleased to see two icebergs here in this outflow from the Amory ice shelf. So I'm absolutely mystified why all these icebergs occurred up here. I just don't know. So here is uh, two pictures by uh, John Hodges of the uh, Cook, Cook's ships in the ice. And Hodges is a remarkable artist, I, I want to say. Uh, I just find these pictures stunning. And here's another Hodge picture. One thing that, uh, that Cook did was he actually recovered uh, fresh water from the icebergs. He used the icebergs as a source of fresh water, treated them as oases. And to do that, in doing that, he was able to get his water supplies up and uh, feed his animals and also give his give his crew a chance to, you know, have baths and and wash their clothes. Uh, so it, it's a remarkable thing that Cook did. And Captain Rue had a copy of Cook's book. So he knew all about this. And here's a quote from, uh, from Cook. He said, surrounded on every side by danger, it was natural for us to wish for daylight. This, when it came, served only to increase our apprehensions by exhibiting to our view those huge mountains of ice, which in the night we had passed without seeing. Oh my God. So how do, one thing we have to address and that is how do water waves and icebergs interact? This is very important when we talk about the collision. Well, one thing that happens is that water waves, as they, as water moves, it tends to move, transport mass, small amount of mass in the direction of wave propagation. This is called the Stokes drift. And because for the icebergs, the water is warmer than the ice, it actually carries heat toward the ice. And it cuts what's called a wave notch into the ice. Now ice is not mechanically very strong. 
So eventually the overburden collapses and we have what's called the formation of a foot. And the old whalers used to call it a ram. And the melt rate is about one meter per day per degree C. And this is from a Wagner paper in 2014. So the Stokes drift carries heat to the iceberg that's concentrated in the top of the water column, melts it, and then it forms this foot. And here's a picture here. You can see the, the ram here through the water. And you can also see that not only has it carved back the ice, but it tends to form these caves in the ice. And these are associated with variations in, uh, in depth. So just like cusps form on a beach, we get these caves forming in the ice. And here was a description of his first, Bruce's first iceberg sighting, the first iceberg sighting from the, uh, from the Guardian. And I'm quoting from his log, this is a pretty small iceberg, not very high. And the thing I found most surprising about this was that the water temperature was 10 to 15 degrees C. And the ship latitude was about 42. Now this, he found this very surprising. I find it surprising. Uh, Cook, Cook's icebergs were never, never at latitudes lower than 50 degrees, 53 degrees south. So that he is 11 degrees north of Cook's icebergs, and he is seeing icebergs in very warm water. And I've downloaded this from Lamont Doherty, and you can see here that the average temperature for December 2020 is also between about 10 and 15 degrees C. So I, I really don't know how these icebergs maintain themselves. So three days later, he sees another iceberg. And this one is enormous. It's 60 meters high. This is his sketch here. And, and they, he decides to go out and collect water from it. So he, he parks downwind of the iceberg and then puts two small boats in the water to collect, to collect ice samples, collect pieces of ice to load up his, to replenish his water. He's been criticized because this is only 12 days after he left Cape of Good Hope, but he did feel he needed water. I also felt from reading his book that he really needed to see icebergs. So, and, and this shows, this shows a number of, this shows the iceberg here, and this shows where the small boat operations were being carried out. And at 7.30 PM, he left the iceberg, steamed up, sailed up here, turned on this, turn on this course here, and then at 8 PM, Rue goes to his cabin. Meanwhile, there's heavy fog coming in, lots of heavy fog, and the boat continues until at 8.30 PM, it collides with this iceberg in the heavy fog. And here's this quote here, a body of ice full as high as our masthead showing itself through the thickest fog I'd ever witnessed. And this shows a picture of a large iceberg taken by the RAF of an ice, iceberg A67 off South Georgia. And this shows the collapse of the ice inside of one of these cavities. You can also see the foot or the ram sticking out from the bottom, from at just below the water line. This iceberg, by the way, after this picture was taken, broke up within, within a month. I mean, it did not last long. And so this shows, this, this shows the collision. I put in the ram here, the, the step in gray. The book, the, the ship 
runs its bow out of the ice and basically destroys its bow. Uh, Rue comes on deck and they and they put the uh, tiller over such that the ship rotates. It then destroys its stern. And the orientation of the iceberg and the ship is such that there's a wind shadow here. Now this ship is only powered by wind. And so the big sails have no wind. So it's stuck here for seven or eight minutes. It's stuck on this, on this, uh, on this foot or ram and it can't get off. There's no way it can get off. And meanwhile, the ice is towering above the ship and Rue is terrified that the ice, more ice is gonna fall on the ship. At the same time, he's pretty happy that the ship hasn't been destroyed. And finally, it breaks loose and sails off. And this just shows a sketch of the ship ramming into the iceberg here. Now, he's kind of relieved. He's kind of relieved about things that I wouldn't be relieved about. He's saying, well, the ship wasn't destroyed. That's pretty neat. And he's saying, the rudder doesn't work, but I can sail a ship without a rudder. I don't care. And so he's pretty happy, but the ship immediately starts leaking, leaking very badly. I think I'll, I'll skip through this, but uh, let me just put it this way, there's a whole bunch of damage. And here, here is a model of Guardian class ship. They've omitted the planks here to show you uh, what, what the, how it's put together. And I put a circle here around the stern. This part was totally destroyed. And the stem, which was also totally destroyed. So water starts pouring in. And the next day, the crew who has been pumping all night, they panic. They panic. And they decide, and he says, fine, if you want to leave, please leave, I'm going to stay with the ship. So here is the, the crew. Oh, and in order to get the small boat out, the small boats out, they have to open the spirit room. And so that many of the crew gets very drunk. It's a, it's a very unpleasant situation. And, um, here he is out here. Here's, here's the word from a, a, a report that he put together showing that his clothes, he started seeing his clothes on the deck. Uh, midshipman Tremlett uh, was dressed in a, in a new gold lace hat of his and his sword and two of his uniform coats. And he went to his cabin. He found that it had been ransacked. His watches, his silver buckles, his pistols, and his sword were gone. Having his watches stolen meant he couldn't calculate the latitude, the longitude. So he was, he was stuck. He was stuck. He had to improvise getting out of here. And this just uh, is a summary slide showing the... Uh, Initially, they had 124 people. When they got into Cape Town nine weeks later, uh, they had 80 people left. In order to get to Cape Town, Rue sailed north. He could do that until he got up to the latitude of Africa. And then he sailed as best he could to the west. And he eventually was able to bring this poor Hulk. This is a sketch. From one of his from one of his notebooks into Cape Town, and I think I think I'd better stop here and turn it over to Maria. Fantastic, um, Maria. Do you want to share your screen? Yes. Let me pull that up. Is that coming through okay, Tavi? It's perfect and we can hear you really well as well. Oh, fabulous. Um, 
Hey, thanks, Dad, for that presentation. Really enjoyed the perspective of science on that poor, poor voyage and, and seeing some of those early uh, depictions of icebergs. And uh, for uh, my complimentary presentation, I'm excited to share with you all some of my work as an expeditionary artist, how um, with drawing traditions inspiration from um, the past, I've been working to communicate climate science through art. And uh, um, give a little bit of background. This is up sketching in Greenland, a lot of what I love to do. And here's a little video from, oh, uh, let's see, is that gonna start up here? There we go. Uh, of what, what is the core of my work as an expeditionary artist. Um, and that is field sketching, working to build what I consider my palette of place, a record of experience and color, and whenever possible, getting to work with scientists to learn science as well, which then I can bring home to my studio and develop into educational materials, exhibits, installations to share and hopefully inspire um, awareness and, and actions using art as a hook. So here's a finished field sketch and a few more little peeks at some of my tools. I mentioned to some of you earlier, I, I do sometimes use vodka, occasionally gin, to lower freezing temperature of my paints, thinking about some of the challenges of working in, in polar regions. Um, and these are my travel palettes. Uh, I now have a company based around um, developing field sketching supplies called Art Toolkit. So these are some of my early Art Toolkit palettes. And some few more examples of field sketches in this process of bringing them to my studio. Sometimes I might just explore color. If it's really too cold to paint or I'm running out of time, um, I'll sometimes do a pencil sketch, and here's how a series from Greenland developed into a painting. I had a sketch, and then I was working at the time, I'll share a bit more shortly, but with Kristen Lydra, marine mammal biologist from the University of Washington, and uh, she, I, I interrupted this sketch when she invited me to come into the helicopter and, and go look for narwhals, so I, I didn't finish that one. So when I got home to my studio, I used my original sketch and painting and color studies to develop a full painting. And we'll also work larger. Um, Doug, you'll, oh, let's jump ahead here. You'll recognize this piece, Doug. Uh, Stormfront, where as an artist, I'm especially drawn to um, the atmospheric light of the polar regions and really helping to emphasize um, uh, what is there, the ice or the, the small details and the stories that come away from um, science or indigenous communities to help share those. A uh, bit of my inspiration, uh, I love that my dad shared John Hodge's work and um, there's, there's a tradition of artists going out and painting and helping bring back images of the landscape to inspire. And Thomas Moran from the Hudson River School is someone whose work I saw many years ago who did field sketches as well as large oil paintings. And this is an example that is 12 feet wide and hangs in Congress. And his work inspired the national park system. And, and seeing this exhibit at the Seattle Art Museum when I was probably in high school made me consider the impact of art in helping to inspire um, action. Uh, another artist I'm very fond of and inspired by is Edward Wilson, who is naturalist doctor and artist on expeditions, the Terra Nova and Discovery with Robert Falcon Scott. He was the one I, I learned about vodka, reading through his journals and appreciated with his work that his watercolors really captured um, this sort of ephemeral light of the polar regions. And, um, and then his, his ability to wear multiple hats in the field where he, he was um, generally useful, which is something I try to embrace when I'm doing field work as well. <laughs> anyone in the field, you need to be able to look for what, what needs doing and help do it. Um, and finally, one more inspiration. This is Emily Carr, um, who's a Canadian painter and writer uh, who really was inspired by the whole Pacific Northwest region uh, from Victoria. And uh, she was just really intrepid. It's nice to see a woman out going on, on expeditions into the forest and visiting the indigenous communities and um, bringing back and creating really terrific images um, really well known, especially for her forests, which are not quite icebergs, but uh, <laughs> wonderful light. Uh, so, so inspiration myself, um, 
thinking about one thing I believe in is art as a tool versus a talent. And, and in my own life, art as a tool, um, it's always been a tool for self-expression. And here you can see me drawing a little comic, expressing my emotions about cleaning my room. And, and dad, there's an early portrait of you from many years ago. Um, and some other inspiration then, of course, is my father, because I grew up with, um, I remember being a young kid and having polar parkas in the hall closet and maps of the Arctic over my bedroom. And um, really helped foster an early curiosity for the ice environments of radio patch phone calls and such and learning about his work. So, so thanks, Dad, for the, the inspiration. Though, Makash, you know, if you'd been studying something like the Galapagos, my, my hands would be warmer when I was sketching. Uh, and then when I was younger, too, art as a tool, thinking about tools for communication. And um, my father was invited to teach in Tokyo. And um, we met a, a Japanese brush maker who really befriended me. And, and my mother really helped foster a relationship with him and me. And we would go up and paint together and gave me dozens of paint brushes, many of which I still use in my own studio. And before I left, when I was 11 years old, his wife cut off my ponytail to make a brush as a coming of age gift, which is a tradition in Japan. And that large horsehair brush is not my hair. That's a big poster painting brush. Um, <laughs> uh, but thinking about art as a tool. And I've, I've always loved science and being a visual person, when I paint or draw things, I'm really transformed into a more state of active observation versus kind of more passively um, taking in information or passing through. And so um, here's an example of how I began to use art for learning and, and um, immersing myself more in science as part of a naturalist project learning about birds. And this is something that I've gone on to use art as a tool for education and seeing about the ways I can use art to inspire others um, from kindergartners through adults through workshops to use art as a tool to explore the natural world um, and ask questions, thinking so much about how art and science um, can be connected through that act of observation, asking questions, and then that inquiry and trying to discover answers and, and learn. And this is done for me with me, um, both indoors and especially outdoors, something I really love. So I wanted to bring, um, give you a little background on a couple projects I've worked on and um, show you some ways that I've used art and made an impact and, and communicated the science um, to a broader audience. Because uh, I know, you know, the scientists I've worked with love their work so much. You know, we all geek out on different things and become passionate about them and have access to some incredible regions such as, you know, the Arctic, remote areas. Um, but they're so immersed in the science, they may love the, the light and the colors and want to help share that, but are unable to. And so getting to work with an artist, I hope that I can help share and express these places through a different perspective where, again, art can act as a hook. And so Imaging the Arctic was a project um, with my, my friend and collaborator, Kristen Lydra, as I mentioned earlier, from the University of Washington. And I love this quote of hers, of there are parallels between art and science, how both perceive and interpret the world using creativity to inspire and inform others. And so um, in the field, I do a mix of my painting, as I showed you, and I also collect multimedia recordings and thought I'd just share with you a little example of something I created from the trip with Kristen to help turn that down a little. But this is to help illustrate um, a sense of her field work, the, the scope and scale of what it takes to go out and look for things like narwhals. So. Kristen's going to come on for a minute and share a little bit. We have to fly offshore until we find ice that's thick enough and dense enough for us to land, which means that we have to go at this point 75 nautical miles up to 100 nautical miles offshore to get to the pack ice and land and be able to work on narwhals. Narwhals are extremely predictable in terms of where they where they like to go. So if you know something about narwhals, it's pretty easy to know where to find them and we can fly out and almost basically know the exact spots where they'll start to show up. They're very predictable and reliable that way, but in other ways they're actually completely difficult and hopeless because they are just really do everything they can to avoid us. 
So having the opportunity to go out on projects like this really helped me appreciate um, what's behind the data, what's behind data points with research, and, and also just the remarkable environment of being 100 nautical miles offshore on the ice and sketching and um, trying to sneak up on whales. And fortunately, I, I'm pretty good at being quiet. This is out sketching on the ice um, after landing there where Kristen and her colleagues were setting up um, acoustic uh, hydrophones to um, try and capture recordings of the whales, which did surface, which was very exciting. And so again, this work becomes stu uh, studio paintings. And here's just some examples. I love big icebergs um, and exploring their textures. I can't create paintings like this outside. This scale is 40 inches wide. Um, and this one is a full five feet wide. Uh, working with a mix of uh, watercolor, a little bit of an opaque white paint called gouache, and then also things like salt to help create textures in the paint. And then here's a, a few more icebergs um, from northern Greenland. And uh, finally, too, some of the, the wonderful settlements that we get to visit um, in the field and thinking about the relationships of people to ice. Uh, so this work came together, this project with Kristen, with um, a capstone exhibition. So we had um, field sketches, studio paintings, catalog, um, did a whole number of presentations, workshops for all ages, and had partners. And this is something I found really fun in putting together outreach project, is seeing where we can partner um, with other people doing related work. Um, so altogether, we, we really reached some terrific audience um, through this project, which I should mention was supported in part by the Vettelson Foundation. So we had some private funding and for other projects, they've been funded through a mix of, um, of grants and then uh, sponsorships own private support. Uh, so we brought in a really wonderful photographer friend of Kristen's named Tina Itkonen to exhibit with my paintings. And then also, a really fun collaboration with Owen Kurtzinger, whose father coincidentally lives in the same town I do and has an exhibit in Port Townsend at the moment, who's a wildlife photographer. Uh, but here's Myths of the Tusk and thinking about different ways to communicate um, science and communicate just the, the, the stark landscape of the Arctic. And so this came together as a um, three room exhibit. And uh, included also artifacts. It's really wonderful when possible to um, find different ways to engage people from field sketches. Um, we included elements of Kristen's polar bear research, which was another fun experience. And so the Burke Museum loaned us a full skin and skull uh, for some natural history perspective. Um, and the, the next project I wanted to give you uh, a little perspective on is my, my current ongoing one, which is on exhibit in Port Townsend right now, um, my hometown here, called Witnessing Climate Change. And this is a collaboration with uh, biologist George Devoki and thinking about STEM to STEAM, how we can integrate arts into the, the traditional STEM disciplines and was a collaboration both with George and an educator friend of ours who works um, in the K through 12 education named Katie Morrison. And so in 2019, Katie and I went up to Cooper Island, which is off the North Slope of Alaska to collaborate with George. And if you're not familiar with George's work, he has been, I think now 47 consecutive years on Cooper Island monitoring the same population of guillemot birds and has been seeing a real stark correlation between the bird population and um, climate change. So again, here are some of the, the field sketches exploring the light and atmosphere of, um, of the island. And I had a terrific quote from George of Cooper Island has almost no vertical or emotional relief. You can see six miles to the horizon in almost any direction. And so trying to capture um, some of those elements. And when I'm outside or in the field, work may be done outside or sometimes in more comfortable places. This is in our tent. And as with Kristen and other work, I was making recordings, interviews to use um, in other parts of my work once I'm back in the studio. And here's a little video I put together with some of this multimedia. Oops, let's see, will this start? There we go. Uh, so this we have as part of the intro at the museum 
to show a little bit of the uh, field process and then a little bit of George's research. And thinking about, you know, especially working 46, 47 consecutive years, um, there's so much data and there's just the effort and the daily process that goes behind collecting that data. And for George's work, this is based around daily nest checks of the guillemots. And so here's our whole crew getting ready to head out with our polar bear protection and weighing chicks, checking on eggs, looking at the health of these birds that have had to change their foraging habits based on the retreat of the sea ice. Here's a little guillemot chick. And uh, a little peek at what as well of, as, of another tool that George uses, which are Reconyx motion sensitive cameras. And um, these are fun to see not only the birds, but also what comes and prowls around. And this particular video was just a couple weeks after we left the island. So, so mom, dad, I didn't have to be around these ones, but we had, <laughs> had some others. Um, and here's George releasing a guillemot. Mm -hmm. So again, tools, tools for research. And I always enjoy thinking about tools for observation, my own tools and also science tools. And on just about every trip I do, I love to do some life-size paintings of um, the tools of that particular trip. So here are some of the precision um, calipers and rulers and uh, a bag for weighing the chicks. And um, I was painting this one in the tent and my collaborator Katie was really grateful when I was done because that, that tent, that, that red bag really started to smell because uh, all those chicks poop in it as they, they get picked up. <laughs> so she was really grateful and to have me done with this particular piece. Um, here's some other sketches and some different styles that I also do helping tell the, the daily story. So I think of myself as a mix of an, of an artist and a storyteller in, in coming back to share this. Um, and similar to Imaging the Arctic, we collected artifacts to help um, bring back elements of the science and the landscape um, to set up in the museum. And all this data that George collects is all, all logged in his yellow notebooks. And here's George, a uh, really wonderful photo by uh, photographer Joe McNally, um, behind just stacks of these notebooks that he has. And how do we communicate all of that together? What are some other ways to do it? And how do we share it? And Katie and I started, and, and that's my, my daughter there, um, with the Climate Curiosity Days in Seattle. And this was what we eked in just before COVID. This event was, um, I think, in Feb end of February, first weekend of March um, 2020, a wonderful event at the Pacific Science Center in the, the Seattle, Washington, um, Seattle. And um, after that, our, our plans were slowed down for the next year by COVID, but picked it back up to develop the exhibit. And I thought I'd just give you all a little peek at my studio process. And so these eggs here on the, the left, the ink eggs, that was a field sketch. And when I work in my studio on large pieces, I'll often do some five by five inch studies and play with textures and colors. So you can see next, there's a little sketch. And then finally, the painting on the bottom of the eggs is a 40 inch wide, so more than three feet wide painting, which is one of the, the focal points of the show um, of the Guillemot eggs. Um, you can see a little peek at the rest of my studio there, all these different studies. And here's another example, too, from the um, <clears throat> image I showed you of George's cabin being developed into a small field sketch into a large full sheet uh, 22 by 30 watercolor painting, um, trying to capture some of that light and atmosphere and also some of the isolation and thinking through um, the impacts and, and uh, how it may feel to be monitoring and up and up in this environment this isolated space for months on end and this is another painting i thought i'd show you called the big blue which um is all about the lack of ice in this landscape that uh for so many years um was there every summer and is retreated to the point where from cooper island or ukiavik we, we we saw no ice uh, so here's a peek at the jefferson museum show which right now is is open through december so a mix of the paintings, field sketches, and um, some installations. Uh, and we partnered as well with um, Joe McNally to include a video documentary um, that he did with 
George. Joe McNally took photos for a New York Times article, um, New York Times Magazine cover story that came out in 2002 and included this photo of George in 2001 um, at the edge of Cooper Island. And they did a repeat of that photo in 2019, really showing the changes that George has witnessed and the, um, the, the, the really visual impact of the, the lack of ice. And in my work as an artist, I, I thought a lot about, well, how do we show this too in the show? And in addition to the show, we put together an exhibition catalog with stories and paintings. And one thing I was really inspired by was working directly with George's data uh, to create a piece where each year could be reflected in a little five by five painting. And so here's a total of 46 little paintings. And the color of the paintings relates to the temperature, um, if it was above or below the average temperature um, recorded. So whether it was two degrees C above or two degrees C below, so ranging from the blue to red. And Zachary Labe um, was one scientist whose work really inspired me to think about the colors. And next with each piece, um, I illustrated the egg data. So uh, there's how many eggs were laid, hatched, and fledged. And then the little icons help illustrate stories relevant to each year and hoping to share some of the personal impacts. Um, when polar bears started visiting the island, when George had to bring in a cabin for safety, when he first brought out uh, survival suits out of concern for if there was um, a storm surge and, and the, the island might be flooded. And so wanting to really bring together in one art installation some of the atmospheric, biological, and personal stories in, in one piece. And so that's what I hope that, that my work together um, can do is help share these stories, use art as a hook, and I, I, I really hope to inspire and engage um, people to talk about and, and take action around climate change. And um, I love working with scientists. I'm always open um, to projects and ideas and, and welcome um, now I think we've got time for, for any questions and um, you can always visit my website to expeditionaryart.com. I can put this in the comments um, to, to see more about these projects. Thank you so much, Maria. And just to point out next week's seminar there by Karen Alley. So, oh, um, sorry about that. I'll that's all right. That you ahead. left it up for a long, good long time. Um, so are there questions uh, for Maria and um, Ceiling. Um. Doug. Um, wow, uh, Celi and Maria, those were just incredible talks. One was terrifying, the other was extremely <laughs> inspiring. Um, it's obvious that the two of you as uh, father and daughter inspire each other and, you know, develop more than any one individual could do. But I always ask the difficult questions. Do you ever get in arguments or fight about your interpretation of glaciers or ice or anything like that? Well, obviously I'm right. <laughs> no, <just> <laughs> <laughs> You know, does, does somebody ever say, no, that's not right. An iceberg can't look like that, you know, and then you have to go back to him and, and correct him. <laughs> oh, no. Good. Oh, you're, all, you're also <laughs> modeling a wonderful family relationship for all of us. <laughs> and I appreciate dad getting to help explain, you know, about like the foot and ram of an iceberg. And I think dad, I remember doing a one of my science projects in elementary school on sea ice. So you helped with my early vocabulary of like frazzle ice and grease ice. And so, you know, I'm trying not to just paint pictures but have some um, scope of understanding about them to, to share. So I thank you for that. Oh, sure. Are sure. there any other questions? Oh, well, I have one. Am I, am I on? Yes. yes. Go for it, Frank. And we'll let Doug back. Uh, you have a show in, in Port Townsend, it sounds like. 
I was not clear on, on where it was. Yeah, yeah um, my show in Port Townsend is at the Jefferson Museum of Art and History. And um, I'll just jot that in the chat. Um, and it's, it's right downtown, um, very close to our fabulous ice cream shop and Maritime Center, which has good coffee on weekdays. So uh, big brick building. And uh, yeah, big br brick building. And um, I'd be happy to, Tavi, would, maybe I'd send this to you. I have um, a recording they've just released of a talk that Katie and George um, and I gave talking about our exhibit and collaboration, if anyone's that. interested. All right. Anyway, you can put that on the uh, email with the um, link to the YouTube and that's, that's that. We have another question from Doug, I think. Yes, this one's for Celie. Um, that I'm very fascinated by the improbability that um, the ship, you know, uh, encountered to to actually encounter an iceberg in that location. Uh, you know, the green dots that you show are way off the normal iceberg trajectories. One of the things that people have suggested about uh, the 18th century is that's about when uh, an ice shelf in the Amundsen-Bellinghausen Sea that may have been buttressing the Thwaites Glacier and Pine Island Glacier would have broken up uh, to yield the current circumstances there. Um, and it's also true that the ice that would be found off uh, South Africa would have had to have originated west of the Antarctic Peninsula. So I wonder if um, you think this particular iceberg that was encountered by the ship is somehow unusual in that it implies a big calving event rather than just some, you know, way out on the end, you know, the tail of the bell-shaped curve, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gee, Doug, I, I don't know. I mean, you could you could argue it either way. Um, it, I, I'd love to have a big calving event. Um, it's it's very difficult for ice to survive when it gets into water that warm. Um, that's one of the things we, we've seen over and over again because of the very efficient way in which uh, warm water destroys destroys icebergs. Um, and there there are these strange events like that iceberg that made it up the coast of South America. I forget the date, and then that 2005 iceberg that made it to uh, to Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, and 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 so uh, I'd be very happy to see evidence of a major calving event. I, I think that'd be wonderful, but uh, it could be something else as well. I, I don't know if we'll ever know. And Roger, I think you had a question for Celie too. Oh, thanks very much. Um, to be honest, I, I've actually, <laughs> if we believe Wikipedia, I've just answered it myself. I was wondering if that that fabulous Kendall watch actually survives, but I gather it's at the um, Maritime Museum in, in Greenwich, along wonderfully with the Harrison clocks, which are a fantastic thing to go and visit. And uh, the watch seemed to have quite an illustrious history beyond that on board HMS Victory at uh, the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. So an amazing, an amazing object. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with the Admiralty that that Harrison should not have received the the prize because uh, his he, he only built one watch and he didn't give them a procedure for building many watches. At the same time, it, it was a work of genius. Uh, and the, uh, the Kendall watch, Kendall only built three of them. And, but I think what happened was that the Admiralty got in the habit, people got in the habit of seeing these watches as a simple solution. And there were a lot of less expensive watches that became popular. They may not have been as good, but at the same time, as places around the world, as, as their longitude was determined more exactly, you could use a less accurate watch to go from A to B, to go from Rio de Janeiro 
to Cape Town, and then you could correct it as you went. So, so yeah, by the time Darwin went on his cruise, they carried 24 watches. <laughs> so, so, so things, things really changed quite rapidly. I, I was, it's, it's a very heartening story. Uh, but uh, didn't uh, Harrison comply with the original um, uh, uh, conditions of the prize uh, in terms of uh, su supplying uh, a watch for one trip? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose. Uh, I don't know, Frank. It, it's a it's a real wormhole to get into, and I. I, I sort of think what they wanted and what they asked for maybe were two different things. Well, what they wanted was was something where they could get 200 of these things and hand them out to everybody. What they got was one really sweet, really sweet watch. And 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 the whole watch episode was so tangled up with the with the venomous dispute with the astronomers and masculine and people like that that <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure it wasn't smooth going in any way whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. There is that lovely book by the by that woman. Um, uh, I forget her name, but it's a it's so a, Bell. Yeah, it's called Lat Longitude. It's a great. It's a really nice it's book. It's a great book. Yeah. There's a very fine BBC drama of of, of the book as well. If anybody wants to find the DVD of it. Okay. Thank you. To get back to the iceberg a second, it, it doesn't seem that too massive a fluke is called for to have one very large tabular berg uh, uh, drift that far and, and then break up into three or a or hundred uh, smaller pieces. Um, wow. you know, it would, obviously it's not something that happens every day, but we don't, even know how rare an occurrence it might be because even even today a brilliant record of icebergs in that part of the uh in that part of the world is not really uh available uh, you know <clears throat> can't really say how rare it is yeah. and 300 300 years ago was it that long uh what um you know, a lot of things would be different. By the way, the temperature that you mentioned, the 10, 10 C, that, that was measured by, uh, yeah. by the ship? Yes, um, uh, Rue carried out a series of, of, of uh, temperature measurements and he got those two temperatures. Uh, he, his, unfortunately, his original journal is lost, so we have to depend on secondary sources. Uh, another source is that is that during this panic, during this drunken panic on the ship, people were just jumping in the water and then going to the boats. I think if the water had been, uh, you know, minus 2C, they would have died. Uh, and so their behavior and survival was consistent with the uh, with the with the measurements, I think Hester has a question for Maria, and um, then we might let you go off to your parents' evening, Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Tavi. Yeah, question, um, Hester. Great question. If I deliberately differentiate between the capital letter A art and illustration, and I do a bit. Um, I I have a design. Um, a little bit of a design background too. And when I do shows, um, my husband as well, we've worked really closely together for years. Um, I'll do things like make some of my own maps and diagrams and design catalogs and books. Um, so it, it's really useful. And I, I see too, some of my stuff, you noticed I have some different styles from maybe some a little more cartoony versus these big um, studio paintings. And so, um, you know, I think about illustration more in, in really telling and showing and telling specific stories and events and um, and some of the, the maybe more capital letter A art are paintings, I feel really compelled as an artist to paint and they, I sort of have them simmering in my head till I get them out. Um, and, um, 
And that, that's sort of one of the joys of doing these projects is getting to tell the stories and then as an artist to have my own interpretation and then try and include, um, have them all work together uh, to, to share and hopefully inspire folks. So thanks for your question. And yeah, thanks so much everyone uh, for being here and uh, for having me. I'm, I'm really thrilled. And like Tavi mentioned, I have to go run um, to a parent teacher meeting <laughs> for my, my new little kindergartner, but I'm really happy to be here um, with you all and for hosting me and my dad. It's a treat to get to, to co-present. So thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed from all of us. I think that we've all had a wonderful evening. So uh, thank you. And Celie, both of you, thank you so much. A lovely duo. And good luck at your parents' uh, meeting. <laughs> thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody, or evenings. <laughs> thank you, Maria.